Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Kelly Vanyette Green uh, with Halstead, and I'm here today with our senior graphic designer and uh, photographer, Janelle. Um, Hi, guys. She is going to be talking um, to you about photography, um, shooting your jewelry, and if it if you think it's worth um, upgrading to a DSLR. Um, if you're new to the jewelry photography, um, she did a webinar for our jewelry business forum about phone photography that you might want to check out, which is kind of like a precursor for this. Um, I will be monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions, um, shoot them in there, and I'll get back to you. Um, if it's a question for Janelle, I'll hold it till the end. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. Take it away, Janelle. Thank you. Hi, guys. Okay, so as Kelly said, I'll be doing a um, presentation on um, whether you should buy, invest in a DSLR. Okay, let me go ahead and start that for you. Okay, so investing in a DSLR for jewelry photography. Is it right for you? What should you look for when you're investing if you want to buy one? And I'll also go over some basic settings to look at if you do end up buying one. Okay, so before we begin, questions can be asked on the chat or on our Facebook group, um, Jeweler Spark after, um, afterwards. You can email us at webinars at halstedb.com. And also the session will be recorded and available to you afterwards. So before you begin on your quest to buy a DSLR, you need to think about some things. So will buying a DSLR be worth it for you. Even entry-level DSLRs can cost a pretty penny. So do you have the money? Entry-level ones tend to be about $500 plus. Do you have the time if you do have the money? Because at this point, you're having to add another um, electronic to your repertoire to do stuff. So you're going to have to take the photos on the camera, transfer them to something else to edit them, then post them. And then also, where will you store and edit the photos? Do you currently have a computer or a tablet? Will you be able to remember DSLRs have a or will give you a lot bigger files? You're going to really bog your computer down. If you have that, you really don't want to save all those many photos on your phone. So how will you store? How will you edit? And are you planning on hiring out photography at any point in the future? If so, is it really worth it to pay $500 to get a camera that you're not going to use in a year. Another thing to think about is your smartphone is an all-in-one camera editing and publishing electronic. Do you really want to give up that convenience? So those are the main points you want to think about before you look, um, you really consider investing in a DSLR. But no matter what, I highly recommend upgrading. And I'll go over the reasons. First off, quality. No matter what, a DSLR will always have higher quality, even entry-level DSLRs. Reason being is they are made for taking photos. Your phone is made for doing a lot of things. So it doesn't have all the, um, it is not made to just take photos, so it won't have all the highest grade quality stuff for it. They are great now, but they will not, do, still do not compare to a DSLR. So if you look at the picture on the left with the phone one, these are greatly enlarged. The phone um, photo is really blurry at this scale, whereas the DSLR, it looks really sharp. You can see a degradation in quality. Depth of field, a lot of people want to have that cinematic look where you know you have your um, piece in focus, but the background is blurred out. So it gets that nice look that um, people really like to see. With a phone, you only have two apertures generally, so you can't really get a nicely blurred background. And if you try the portrait mode, it uses an AI, so it um, might not properly blur out that background for you. Whereas the DSLR, because that blur is built in with the lens, it's automatic and you can set how much blur you want. So on the top is the phone, obviously, and on the bottom is a DSLR. You can see on the um, wood on the uh, right part how much more blurred it is for the DSLR than it is the phone. Focus stacking. 
So you've probably never heard this term before, but if you do have a lot of white background shots and you have larger pieces, this may be really useful for you. Um, basically, what focus stacking does. So if you want all of your item in focus for a uh, your white background shots, you generally have to do a wide aperture. So it has a huge depth of field, so that entire piece is in focus. The problem with that is that a wide aperture lets in a lot less light. So then you really, really, really have to up your um, lights, make it as bright as possible. So on the left with the large aperture, I had the lights on as bright as they could go. And that's how dark it came out. I didn't edit either photo. And then on the right with focus stacking, I used a smaller aperture. And what it did is it took several photos of the pieces one by one at um, different, like, Here's a photo at the beginning, a little bit back, here's the middle, here's a little bit further back, here's the end. And it stacks all of those together so everything's in focus. And because it's at a smaller aperture, which is letting in more light, you don't have to use, you can use your lighting. <laughs> and the lighting here, like I said, on the left with the large aperture, it was blown all the way up as it could. On the right, I had it almost as far down as it could go. So that's a huge benefit for focus stacking. Some cameras come with it. Others, you have to get a software. But, I mean, it is a huge benefit for, for you if you can do that. So here's what our um, program looks like. If you look at the bottom part, it has a stack of five images. So, like I said, it took front, quarter, middle, back quarter, end, and stacked those all together to create a nice, sharp image. And finally, Maybe you're just not getting what you want out of your phone. That's what ended up happening to me when I had my first DSLR. I mean, it was a great DSLR. I was getting good photos. Um, everything looked right. But once I got into the editing, it didn't, it started looking horrible because I zoom in to edit. It was just grainy. It just wasn't high enough quality for what I wanted anymore. And if that's how you're feeling, you're, you have your lighting right, you're taking the photos right, and things just aren't as you want it, you might want to upgrade to a DSLR. So here's, again, another picture of the quality. If you're really taking photos and you're trying to zoom in and you're showing stuff, huge difference in quality. So I highly recommend it if you really are thinking about it. But I just do, I do want to say, don't upgrade to just to upgrade. DSLRs are not a magic fix for bad photography. Like I said with mine, I knew my lighting, I knew all my situations, I knew how to um, edit, my photos still weren't meeting my um, standards. That's why I decided to upgrade. But for you, if you're not really a photographer, you should at least understand photography basics first. And mainly lighting, editing, and product staging. You should at least know two of those three, because if you try to get a DSLR on top of that, you're going to have to um, now learn all the stuff on your DSLR in addition to lighting, editing, and product staging. <laughs> and trust me, cameras have a lot of features to them. I've had mine for two years and I don't know all of its features yet because there's so much to it. Okay, so how to buy a DSLR if you do upgrade. So list your needs beforehand. Do you need a camera that can take great video? Do you need something that works great in low and light environments? Will you be taking a lot in your studio where you can't really bring in your um, photography lighting? Do you need something that's easy to use? Some cameras do have an easy mode on its um, settings, so you're not having to deal with all these extra bells and whistles. And separate your absolute needs from your wants. And when you do that, think about your needs for the future. So do you really need 4K video or are you fine with 1080 HD? Because, you know, the 4K camera that you might want could price you out of your price range. So just keep that in mind. Know what you want right now. Know what you need right now. Know what you need in the future. And then base your um, picks off of that. It's like shopping for a car. You don't want to just go out randomly without knowing what you need. Okay, so terms you should know when buying a DSLR. And these aren't, when I talk about these terms, I'll tell you what the 
I'll tell you like an iPhone compared to a pro DSLR. You do not need to look for things that are at the pro level. You're not selling your photography. You just need photos to sell your jewelry. So you do not need top end professional camera. But I'm going to show you the differences between, you know, again, the, an iPhone smartphone compared to a pro camera so that you can see how much of a difference those things are. So the first thing that you'll, one of the things you'll run into when you're um, looking at a DSLR is sensor size. So a sensor basically is what captures data. It's not how big your picture will end up being or how high quality it is the amount of information that um, your camera will capture as the photo is taken. So the larger your sensor size is, the more data it can get. So it'll have uh, more colors to it, a better depth for the lights and the darks. So when you go into editing, you are able to do more with your editing. So as you can see on the top left is an iPhone 11. That is tiny compared to a full frame camera. Most entry level and mid range have the APS-C, which is perfectly good. I mean, you're already what? Nine times larger than an iPhone 11. So you're getting so much more information with that. Next thing you'll see is megapixels. And you probably know this term from actually buying your smartphone. You'll see it a lot. They'll tell, hey, we have a 12 megapixel camera. So what are megapixels? Basically, that is how large and high quality you can print your phone, your um, pictures at. This is what um, determines the quality of your photos. So the iPhone 11 has a 12 megapixel camera whereas a professional camera can have 36 or even higher. So you can see the big difference between those two. So on a 36 megapixel, you can print like a huge poster size, whereas the iPhone 11, once you get to that size, you'll start getting that pixelation and stuff. And generally with the entry level, you'll get around 24. Autofocus and autofocus points. You'll see this. And depending on you, um, for you, it generally should not matter the differences, but I will tell you like basically autofocus points are the amount of points your camera can um, focus with. So on entry level cameras, some of them have nine. So it can only focus on nine points within that view you have. If you're taking a lot of shots that are centered, where your jewelry item is centered, you do not need something that has the 51 point system. That's just over um, blowing it. If you're doing model shots, maybe you do want the 51 points um, autofocus system because then you will have something in different areas that you can't really capture just on one point or nine points. ISO range. So this you'll see a lot of cameras have similar ISO ranges, but this is important. Not You'll never want to shoot at ISO 1, 128,000 because that will bring in so much noise. If you've ever seen a photo of like a black starry night and it looks rainy, that's the ISO. It's noise created from the um, sensors. And what's important about these numbers is that gives you generally cameras that have a higher ISO for their upper range can shoot better pictures in the medium ranges. So an earlier one of our earlier cameras had an ISO range of 100 to 6400 and shooting at an ISO 400 started you started to get a lot of grain. Now the camera can go from 100 to 56000 and shooting at ISO 400 is so much better. There's a lot less noise than compared to the earlier camera. So that's what you'd wanna look at when you see that ISO range. And continuous shooting rate. So again, if you're shooting a lot of white background shots, it's on a tripod, this number will not be as important to you. But if you do plan on um, shooting without a tripod, you know you're not as steady with your hands. Continuous shooting rate is really important because it's how many shots per second that your camera can take. And a lot of times you'll see it as six FPS or six frames per second. So if you know you're unsteady with your hands, you might wanna look at a camera that can do a higher shots per second. 
So a lot of people might ask us, what cameras do we use? Well, a when I started here, we had a Canon EOS Rebel T3. And I personally at that time had a T3i. <laughs> there wasn't too much difference besides the fact that the screen, the back monitor can pop out. Currently, and we upgraded about the same time. So currently at Halstead, we have the Canon EOS Rebel T7i, which is basically the newest version of the T3 whereas I personally upgraded to the Nikon D850. So as you can see, there's a huge difference in some of the um, uh, specs for these um, cameras. So for Halstead, they went, we went from having an 18 megapixel camera to a 24. Our ISO range went from 100 to 6400 to 125, sorry, yeah, 25,000. <laughs> That is a huge difference, I was saying. So with that higher range, now we can take photos at ISO 400 that look really good. And for my Nikon D850, I have a full frame sensor, so my photos have much more depth to them than the Canon T7. But if you look at the comparison of photos, especially for jewelry photography, your customers will not notice the difference there. So again, you do not need a professional camera in entry level or mid range is perfect for product photography. Okay, videography. Do you plan on using the camera to capture video? If you're doing so, you want to look at movie resolutions. As you saw um, with our other ones, some go 1080 HD is the highest they can go. Others can go 4K, 8K even. They are really getting some good ones out there. Another thing you might wanna look at is the monitor size or the screen on the back. And if you have a hard time seeing, if your eyes aren't great, you might want a camera with a larger monitor size so it's easier to see what you're doing <laughs> as you're shooting the video. Now lenses. This is a whole new ball game for you guys because it's not just the camera you're buying, you're having to worry about the lenses. So first things first, do not even plan on looking at lenses until you know which camera you want to buy. The reason being is brands can have different lens mount types. So not all Canon lenses can fit on every Canon camera. There's different lens mount types. So once you know what you want for the camera, you can actually input into most of the um, the top, like buying places, I have this camera, what lenses can fit it? It's kind of like buy, buying tires for your car. So that's a great way to see what works, but know your lens mount. Also, you can buy a cheaper lens, just do not buy the cheapest lens you can um, find. Read the reviews on it. A low quality lens can really, really just make a high quality camera it ruins all the quality for it. You do not get that quality anymore because low quality lenses will just distort things, give you grain, stuff like that. So read the reviews on it, specifically read product photography reviews for those types of lenses. So lens types you might want to look for. Macros are great. If you know you're doing a lot of close-up work, maybe you're just shooting white background or black background photography, you might want to look at a macro. Telephoto lenses can work for um, macro shots when you're up close and personal, but the problem is they cannot focus at a close range. You have to get really far back for that telephoto lens to um, shoot the item. It can work, but it does make things a little difficult and awkward. But if you do plan on shooting like model shots, you may want to look at a telephoto lens just so that you can get that variety, sorry <laughs> about my hiccups. Okay, another thing you can look at is zoom lenses. A lot of times you'll see on the internet, prime is the way to go. At this point, zoom lenses have improved so much that for product photography, zoom lenses are perfectly great. You do not have to get a prime lens. So if you know that you're going to be doing a lot of close-up work and a lot of like model shots or farther back shots, Zoom lenses, like an 18 millimeter to 55, is a great option for you. Another thing you'll see when you're looking at um, lenses is the aperture. 
So aperture is important if you want a black, a good background blur. So a lower aperture, like an f 1.4, will give you a lot more blur in the background than if you got an f 4. Your camera just will not have that as much. It'll have more in focus in that background. So if you really want that cinematic look, look for something that's an f 1.4 or 1.8. Places to look. Once you know what you want, now you need to know where to buy it. So there's places like Adorama, BNH Photo, um, and Amazon. So the good play things about Am um, Adorama and BNH Photo is they will have used cameras and they will have um, basically certified used cameras. They will tell you hey, this one's like new. Hey, this one has a few flaws. It was scuffed on the um, uh, casing. So if you're not, if you're wanting to buy a camera, but you don't want to pay full price, those are two great places to look at for getting a used one. Amazon, you don't know the seller. <laughs> at least Adorama and B&H Photo will give you the quality and certif certification on how it is. Um, you can also look at Nikon, Canon, Sony, their specific websites. Shop around, see which price is better. Sometimes one place will have a deal, other times they won't. So all depends. Tips for buying. Before you buy, you might want to test run the camera. There's places where you can rent cameras. If you have a local um, camera store or something that you can actually take out the camera, feel see how it feels. Maybe you're planning on doing a lot of model shots and you find the camera is kind of heavy. Do you really want that camera? So it's great to test run the camera and see how it feels for you. Read plenty of reviews and make sure you look up product specific reviews. How did this camera do for product photography? Uh, watch tutorials. Again, whatever camera you choose on buying, whatever the make, if you go to the Nikon website, they're going to have lots of great tutorials on your specific camera. Same with Adorama and B&H Photo. Definitely check out all the tutorials that you can so you know all the features about your camera. You really will want to invest in an external hard drive. Like I said, these a DSLR will give you larger file sizes because you're getting in so much more information. You do not want to save that on your phone. You do not want to save that on your computer. It's going to take up a lot of space. So buy an external hard drive and save your photos directly to that. Buy a new tripod. If you already have one for your um, smartphone, trust me, your camera's going to be heavier. You'll need a new tripod that can withstand that weight and it's more sturdy. You really don't want your tripod falling over the first day you get it and ruining your new camera. You also may want to buy a gray card. At this point, you should be so used to editing and comfortable enough with it that a gray card is a smart solution to um, for your auto white balance. That way you can say, okay, here's the grays and then it'll auto correct the coloring for you. Okay, using your DSLR. Hey, now you got it. Test run it first. So remember what I said about the ISO range earlier? Test your camera. See what the um, how high you can go on the ISO before it starts getting grainy, before you get that degradation. You really want to see that so you know, hey, when I'm out shooting, don't ever go above 400 ISO. Don't ever go above 800 ISO because at that point it starts getting low quality. Just make sure you do that and test out different things. For your settings, shoot raw format. At this point, if you're upgrading from your phone to your DSLR, shoot in raw. RAW will capture more data. RAW saves more data. You got the DSLR for that data. Make sure you save that data. A JPEG will automatically compress everything. So when you get to editing, you really want that RAW format. Shoot at the lowest ISO possible because even though your camera might look good at 400 or 800 ISO, it will always be sharper, a much sharper image at 100 or 200. Also shoot at the fastest shutter speed possible, especially if you're not using a tripod. Because if you're um, taking beauty shots, you're not on a tripod, you're going around, you may start getting that motion blur if you're not steady with your hands. So you'll have to test out what works best, but get the lights, 
get the ISO, test out the shutter speed, test out the aperture all together, see what works best. You may have to adjust different things to make sure you're not getting any blur from moving about. And aperture, again, for that one, that's how much, how blurry the background is. That is up to you. So maybe some people want everything in focus. Some people want their, the only thing in focus to be their jewelry piece. If you only want your jewelry to be the focus, have a lower aperture. Just don't go as low as possible. So if you have an f 1.8 lens, go to the f2 or um, so range because at the f 1.4, your jewelry piece might not be fully in focus. It's not going to be as sharp as possible. And another thing, if you're outside shooting photography with variable lighting, you may want to use aperture priority. So that way you can say, hey, I want this much depth of field. I want this the background blurred this much. Okay, the lighting's going to change. Then it will automatically change your ISO and your shutter speed. So the only problem is if you get into a really dark area, you'll have to be careful because it might change that shutter speed to be very slow, and you'll get a very blurred picture. It's happened to me, Tressie. I know. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Okay, tips for shooting on white backgrounds. You definitely should have a tripod. You only want to do your, you want to make sure you have that set up and going, have your light set up, everything. And because you should be on a tripod, shoot in manual mode. You aren't having to worry about variable lighting. So everything should be all set up. One light um, system, one light source, nothing's gonna be changing throughout that set. So manual mode, figure out the pe best lighting. That way, you know, if you take 50, picture, 50 pictures, you can edit one and then apply those edits to all of them. Um, ISO between 100 and 200. Again, you have your own lighting. Just make sure it's bright enough to get um, that piece well lit, aperture. So generally with white background items, you want them either fully in focus or mostly in focus. People are trying to decide if they want to buy based off this image. So depending on the size of your item, how far back it goes from the camera, you'll probably want to do an F5 plus. So if it's an F14 will be a, have a piece that's more in focus than an F5. The only problem with that is the larger your aperture, remember this is where I talked about focus stacking, where it's great. The larger your aperture, the less light it will let in, so you're gonna have to blow up the lighting in your studio. So that's where you may want to get focus stacking if, you know, it's, you can't pick, images are just turning out too dark. You're having to use ISO 800 to get them bright enough and fully in focus. For shutter speed, you want it above 160 if you don't have a remote shutter release. And I know it may, it's already on a tripod, but with, you're trying to shoot the photo by clicking the button, you're still um, moving that camera even just a little bit. So you are messing it up. So um, you may want to look at getting a remote shutter release for that. Okay, so shooting jewelry beauty shots. Tripods are optional. I tend not to use a tripod when shooting beauty shots. The reason being is I like to move around when I take my shots. So if you know you like want one setup, kind of like a white background shot, go ahead and use that tripod, get it there. Or if you're doing something where you're gonna be like switching out different rings to make a GIF of later, then I highly suggest a tripod. But if you're trying to get just different beauty shots, I wouldn't use a tripod. Manual mode again, generally, if you're doing beauty shots, you're indoors. So you'll have all the lighting set up. You don't need to worry about messing with things too much. So get your um, settings and keep them there. Um, ISO between 100 and 400. Your lighting is gonna be a little bit more different compared to if you're doing white background stuff. You're gonna have more variable on things in the picture. So you may have to bump it up to 400. Aperture, you may want a blurrier background. You want may want less um, depth of field. So you may want to go down to F2. Shutter speed, again, variable. If you know you're a shaky person and you can't hold that camera steady, you'll want to do a higher shutter speed. Also, set your camera up in the continuous shooting mode. We talked about this earlier. What is your um, shooting 
rate. How many frames per second can it get? If you put it in continuous shooting mode, then you can get those burst shots so that if you do mess up the first one, maybe the next two will be more in focus. When it comes to props, you'll want to test, do test shots of textured items, specifically things like cloth where it has a tight weave. That can mess up the camera. You'll get these weird aberrations, stuff like that um, on the shot. So you may want to not use that certain cloth and switch it out to a different one. And also be careful of reflective surfaces in your, um, you're already shooting a reflective piece with jewelry. Do you really want to incorporate more reflective pieces by putting in like a glass or something? So just be wary of that because you're now gonna have to deal with even more reflective surfaces. And like I kind of stated earlier, where I don't like using a tripod, I suggest shooting from multiple angles. That way you can do one setup and get two photos for social media from it. So you can do kind of like a side shot, more of an upper shot. Great way to do it. Okay, so shooting on models. So if you're indoors, generally, again, your lighting setup is just going to be one setup. I'd suggest going to manual. If you're outdoors, manual if you are comfortable with it. For me, I am. I know to always check. I check my um, camera every few shots. I look and see. Okay, maybe I need to up the ISO. Maybe I need to lower that um, up the aperture. Something like that. If you are not comfortable with doing that much work with manual mode, do aperture priority. So that way you can say, I want the background this blurry. Okay it'll automatically adjust the um, ISO and your shutter speed for you. So that way you're not having to mess with your camera as much as you shoot. Again, you'll wanna put it in continuous shooting mode so you can get those burst shots, so you can get a better shot if you know you're gonna be shaky on the camera. Again, like I said, review photos often. But especially if you're shooting outside, review your photos often. You wanna make sure you have the correct settings you may have to make adjustments. And don't set your monitor screen too bright. If you're out on a bright sunny day, you will wanna set it brighter. But if it's not too bright out, don't keep it on the brightest setting because then you may under or overexpose your photos depending on where your monitor brightness is. So don't stop learning on these things. If you're unsure, if you want to um, move up to a DSLR, you're still working on your phone, <clears throat> Sorry, your phone photography skills. We have some great resources on that. As Kelly said before, I did a um, webinar and a blog on how to shoot um, jewelry photography with your phone. Definitely go through that. Get make sure you know those basics. If you're investing in a DSLR and you haven't yet, you probably should invest in getting things like studio lights, um, a light box, stuff like that. So I'd suggest reading our Build a Jewelry Photography setup for $100, because then you can get some ideas on, okay, maybe I should get one light, maybe I should get these types of lights, this type of tripod, stuff like that. I would highly suggest it. You're getting the DSLR for a reason. Make sure you get the things that go with it too. And also, if you're getting a DSLR, you can shoot more video now. And we just did a blog on how to shoot your own video. And in today's world, video is becoming more and more important, not only on social media, but on websites, on um, your shop website. So you really may want to look at incorporating some video into your repertoire. So if you get a DSLR, you can start shooting those um, nicely blurred background videos, get it more cinematic, great, beautiful shots. So we just did a plug on that. Be sure to check it out. And any questions? Hey, Janelle. Hi. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, so for sensor size, is that correlated to resolution? And does, does a bigger sensor mean greater megapixels? No, there are two separate things. Sensor size is how much data your camera collects as it takes a shot. So how much of, say, like I was kind of overexposed, a bigger sensor size will be able to say, hey, this is brighter than this pot spot. The megapixels is the print and the quality size. So sensor size is the data of the image. 
the megapixels is how big your image is can be. And what is like resolution mean? Within resolution is um, a higher resolution is bigger, basically. So depending on, um, you generally won't see that with the cameras. You will see it with the, um, mostly with the video stuff where they're like the 1080 HP. So at that point, it's like 1080 by 720 and it's pixel size. So it's kind of like, well, how big is that? Well, a lot of the things you see are at 1080, like on your TV. 4K, which is basically the next bigger size, you'll see a lot of um, TV companies touting the 4K TV. So you know that, you know, what your TV right now is 1080, that's a pretty good resolution. 4K will give you a lot more at a lot bigger though. So it's okay. basically how big your image can be. <laughs> okay. Casey, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Casey asked that question. So put it, um, if you have any further questions on that, Casey, just put it in the um, chat and I will ask um, Janelle. Um, she also had a question about zoom lenses. Um, are they kind of like an all purpose lens? Like she likes to shoot close up and far away. Is there a certain type of lens you, um, you recommend? Yeah, I basically have, except for one lens, all of mine are zoom lenses because I do like that variety. So if you are up close, you'll want something that's maybe at an 18 millimeter. So you get that wider shot closer. But if you wanted to shoot models, shooting an 18 mil, uh, millimeter part of the lens will actually distort the person. So you want something above 50 millimeter. I know that sounds, um, you're like, why are you saying that now? But you know, you want that range. If you do want a range, do go with a um, zoom lens. And if you're shooting a model, make sure you're shooting them at 55, 50 millimeters plus. So 50 to 75, you know, that high at the higher end. Okay. Um, Judith said, how do you get full screen? I'm thinking just certain cameras have that feature. Full uh, um, I think full you should have or um, it doesn't say specific. Judith, if you have um, a specific, I, I think you did show the image about sensor size where it went from iPhone to the mid-level to full screen. Um, is that just the type of camera? Not the sen yeah, the sensor size is, um, I don't think I can get back to that without going through all these slides. Um, so if you're looking at the images you've Viewing as you take the photos, that's the monitor size. The sensor size, again, is the how much data you can get in. The full frame sensor sizes are what you generally find on pro level cameras. And like I said, you really don't need a full frame sensor. You're not selling your photography. So that um, generally what the entry level to mid range is, is the APS-C, which is kind of like half of between an iPhone and a um, full frame. Okay. Um, one more question um, for lighting. Is there a type of bulb um, that is there any recommendations? Um, what is ideal for product photography for probably for like a studio setting like background? Um, I can't say a specific brand, but they do have light bulbs that are basically as neutral. I don't know the correct term for it, but it's basically neutral. So it's not going to be too warm. It's not going to be too cool. It'll give you that middle range. So I suggest looking for that type of light. Just look up product photography lighting. We'll have a good amount of sets for you. Well, if anybody else has any other questions, please put them in the chat now. Um, Janelle, if you think of anything after, you can reach her at webinars at halstedbead.com. Um, you can also go into our Facebook group. Um, it's called the Jeweler Spark. And um, we have 3,000 jewelry artists in there, so they also might have some suggestions on lighting and cameras and things like that. Um, you know, everybody has a different opinion and has worked with different things, so. And I've learned things from there, so you know yeah. it's really good. Well, oh, I have someone, um, a question. Liza, I'm currently using the, the Canon Rebel T3 with the lens that came with it, it's 18 to 55 millimeter. When shooting my jewelry, I often get beeps uh, from the camera, I can't get as close as jewelry as I would like. Is is what I want. <laughs> yes. So that's exactly what I was talking about with using a telephoto lens for 
jewelry photography is those are made for being farther back from the subject. Macro lenses are being up close and personal, so they'll be able to focus at a closer point. And there are macro, if you don't wanna buy a new lens, though these can still be as expensive, so maybe you do want to buy a lens, but there are uh, basically, add-ons that you can put on your lens <laughs> to make it macro, your current lens. Okay. And then do most DSLRs come with a lens or do you always buy separate? Um, Entry-level ones generally, it's called a kit. So you can see like if you go for the Canon T7, they have like an 18 to 55 millimeter kit. So it comes with the 18 to 55 millimeter lens. Some will be like a um, 75 or 55 to um, 125 millimeter lens. So if you see that, that's the lens that comes with it. Do you work with more than one lens for your camera? Yes. Okay, so, so you can buy multiple lenses for the one. Mm -hmm. And I'd suggest, again, doing some, if you know you're doing a range, get a zoom lens. It will make it life so much easier for you instead of trying to be like, having a prime one and like, okay, I have to keep getting back or I have to keep getting close to get the good shot. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all for being with us today. Like I said, I put the link in there to our Facebook group. Um, me and Janelle are in there all the time. Um, you also, if you don't have Facebook, you can email us at webinars at healthsteadfeed.com. So thank you so much, Janelle, um, for all your info. Um, anybody that's registered, if you had any issues with the broadcast today, you will receive a link later this afternoon um, with the replay. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, have a great night. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.